Today was a rough day. I can't lie, you know, rent to rent and property in general can have some amazing days. It's good when the cash flow is coming in, when you're getting the refinances you want, when you're getting all the deals and when everything runs smoothly with your team systemized and you're sat here relaxing. But the reality is it's not always gonna be like that. And today's been one of those days and we're doing content. And I thought, you know what? I wanna share with you my biggest five rent to rent loans, all right? The five things that have been the hardest for me to deal with. And I'll be, I'll be 100%, I'll keep it real with you. There's been way more than that. But on this video, I'm gonna share five of them with you. I'm Simon, rent to rent specialist and mentor. And over the past five years, I've built a seven figure revenue rent to rent business. And I don't go out and buy stupid stuff. Well, sometimes I do. Um, but usually I reinvest that into assets that I own for the long-term legacy wealth. And it's completely transformed my life. I love life. Um, I've managed to help so many people and family members. And then, you know, I train hundreds of you to replace your income and scale your rent to rent businesses as well, which is really, really rewarding. But the fact of the matter is it's not always smooth sailing. And today's one of those days it's been tough, you know, just certain things not going our way, you know, certain tenants causing trouble and you're having to speak to guarantors and arrears and, you know, certain essay scenarios, which, you know, every month I try and go and inspect a few of my essays and I've done that today and I'm not happy with the standard on some of them. So, you know, uh, I just did a bit of a mood just to vent, and that's what I'm gonna do on this video. If you enjoy content like this, and if you like the realness, just comment below. So, I'm gonna share with you my five, I say my five, it's five of, there's loads more, <laughs> and there's loads of highs, but I'm gonna share with you five rent to rent lows right now. Number one, I had three roof leaks in one weekend, literally, because that's what happens over the summer, um, the spring and the summer, you know, you don't notice leaks because there's no rain or there's not enough to compound. And then sometime in September or October, the weather changes and boom, all hell breaks loose. And we had about three or four days of heavy rain and I had three property roof leaks. Um, two were really bad, okay? Uh, two in uh, HMOs, one in an SA. Uh, the SA was that bad, I had to rehouse the guests, I had to move them to another unit, but then I didn't have another unit for the whole time, so then I had to put them up in a hotel for a night, which was an absolute nightmare. And then my HMOs, one of them was pretty minor, the other one was bad, uh, really, really bad, because the water not only came from above, but it also, it, it was like a flat roof and it also came from underneath. So we had to move that tenant out. The whole carpet got sodden and um, yeah, nightmare. And what I learned from that was, you know, when it rains, it pours. But what I learned from that is even though in rent to rent, the roofs aren't our responsibility, when you've got tenants and guests that you've, you know, that you committed to, it is your responsibility, but you just don't have to pay for it. So what I did was I found a great roofer, uh, two in fact, that if I ever have situations like that, we can at least do a temporary fix, take pictures, send them to the landlord with quotes, get the clearance to do the works, but it's just handy to be able to do the heavy lifting. So make sure that your power team extends beyond just the cosmetics so that when things like this happen, you can be responsive, act quickly and sort it out. So we've overcome that now. When there are roof issues, I'm on it. I've got a guy, we'll go and do it. We'll put some, um, Tall pole in or whatever on there and 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 then we will you know make plans to get it dealt with number two rent arrears now i would go as far as to say is 99 percent of my tenants are good uh, we do have a lot of professionals and we do a lot of students as well but they have guarantors and student loans but every now and then you get rent arrears and it's tough because let's face it, the, um, you know, the rights are very much in favor of tenants. And because at the end of the day, that's the place they live. I'm talking HMOs here, not SA. And we've had a couple of rent arrears, especially around COVID, that have gone into the thousands, multiple thousands of pounds. And it's tough because you wanna support them, 
but you're guaranteeing the rent and you're paying for all the utilities and you have to do sections and get legal advice and all this stuff. And a lot of the time, well, I, my whole thing is I don't mind if, if someone's in rent arrears, but they communicate. But every now and then you'll get one that won't. They'll be off the grid. And it just gets a bit messy. And I've had a couple of situations where it's been really, really tough. I've even had to pay a tenant to move on and take even more of a hit. Um, but, you know, it, it's a really, really rare thing. And it's a really low percentage. So what I've learned to do is you've got to vet tenants correctly. So I've developed a system now that vets them very carefully. I, I train my team to always follow their gut because it can all look good on paper. It can all look great. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes you've got to follow your instinct. Um, so I always train my staff now. There's, there's key things that you have to do, but then also follow your gut. And if something feels off, it might be off. So let's swerve. Um, really, really quickly. Um, I, I've, I've had some interesting ones. I could tell stories and there'll be plenty more time for that. But yeah, not good, not nice. The second thing I've learned to do is if somebody is struggling, act on it quickly. And if you need to release them from the tenancy, uh, don't let it build up for months and months and months and months um, at a time. Really important. Because once it gets above two months, it becomes really, really hard for people to claw that back. So get systems in place. Make sure that you follow your gut. And then if you see them going over two months, sometimes it's better just to pay them to move on and find somewhere that's more affordable or move in with a family member so that they don't get themselves into more trouble. Number three, let's move over to serviced accommodation. I've had some naughty guests some naughty, naughty guests that want to party or do things that they shouldn't be doing in the property. Um, I even had a situation where a guest booked on an online travel agent, they, um, they extended directly and then just kind of took it upon themselves to just stay in the property and stop answering my calls and not let the cleaners in. So uh, that was really, really tough. So um, and that could have really escalated and been a, a bad situation, actually, because in serviced accommodation, when somebody's in the property, they've got a license to occupy it. They've not got a tenancy agreement. But you really need to make sure that even when people book on Airbnb and they transfer to a direct booking, don't be lazy because it's so easy to think, oh, do you know what? You can just extend, um, you know, pay me via bank transfer or, or whatever you're going to do, uh, invoice and this, that and the other. But if you've not got them signing your terms and conditions and your own short let agreement, then technically they can get squatters rights. Um, and I've done this a lot. Like I'll have a five day booking with Airbnb and they want to extend and I'll just send them an invoice, take the money um, for that. But then I'll kind of not follow up with terms and paperwork and get a bit complacent because I'm busy doing other stuff or the team's busy. Don't do that. Never do that. Because if for whatever reason something happens, you've not got a signed booking form stipulating the, the rights that they've got to that property on that day, you are going to find yourself in big, big difficulty trying to remove them from the property. And it gets really complicated and, you know, you have to start getting authorities involved in all this stuff. So you don't want to do that. And I bet at home you're like, oh, do you know what? This is a bit scary. Um, I'm not saying this stuff to scare you. I'm just keeping it real and telling you the reality. It's not always going to be plain sailing in Dubai, having cash flow whilst everything runs fine. I speak to loads of you and they're like, oh, I want passive income. I want it systemized. And you can do that. But even with the greatest systems in the world, you have to understand that sometimes things are going to go wrong. Um, but what we do is we learn, we systemize it so that things go wrong a lot less often. All right. That's the key. And there's loads of things you can do from a service accommodation side before they move to the in move in um, move into the property before they check in that can. Uh, stop this as well. So we do loads of checks now and that's really important too. Number four, I've got rent to rents that are close to the city. So I thought, oh yeah, you can't fail, but they've been in slightly 
um, more troubled areas, should we say. <laughs> now, look, the fact of the matter is you want to be close to town. You want to be near these, you know, key guest magnets or tenant magnets. That's what we call them. We've got eight key guest magnets that you want to focus on. But, but, but if you can see mattresses on streets, loads of rubbish, litter, stray dogs, um, you know, naughtiness going on on street corners, you do not want that. Two reasons. Reason one, because your guests and your tenants aren't going to like that. Reason two, because it's going to be so much harder to manage properties. I've had properties where, you know, where there's been an incident, a next door neighbour uh, has kicked off and a window's been smashed and all kinds of madness that you just don't need. So I've learned the hard way no matter how central the property is, if you're not sure about the area, don't do it, okay? You can have as many key things in there as possible. If it's a troubled area, I don't know, troubled area, I like that. If it's a troubled area, then just keep it moving. It's not worth it. And if you don't know if it's a troubled area, I recommend driving there in the day, driving there at night, and having a little look and see if you would feel safe staying there. If not, move on. Another top tip, that's why it's good to stay close to home. Because when you're close to home, you know the nooks of the crannies, the good areas, the bad areas, so it's easier. Whereas if you go 200 miles up the road, you're not going to know. And the amount of investors that hit me up and say, hey, what's this street like in my area? And they're seeing it as close to town, but I know that's a really bad area. It's crazy. So don't make that mistake. All right. Don't make that mistake. And last but not least, I've had boiler issues or serious other issues where I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place because if I've got an SA guest in for a week and the boiler's not working, so there's no hot water, and I go to the landlord or the agent and try and get the works done, but they drag their heels or they want to get three lots of quotes, I'm stuck. Because in a usual situation, what would happen if, if you're a tenant in a property and the boiler breaks, you go to the agent, they get quotes, they come out to you, you understand that things are going to go wrong, you wait for it to get fit. But when you're rent to rent in a property and you've got a guest paying you £200 a night and that happens, the guests don't care. They want a refund. They want to be rehoused. They're going to give you a bad review. And you're stuck between a rock and a hard place because you're not going to spend three grand on the boiler to get it done quickly. So you're kind of waiting for the landlord and the agent to act. And that is tough. And what I learned from that was I needed to add a clause in all my agreements that mean that in the event that something like that happens, we can stop paying the rent because we are unable to operate our business model. And that's key. And I, I've got that in my agreement now. And that's that's in the ultimate rent to rent agreement pack. So um, if you've not already got that, check out renttorentagreements.com because the, the little intricacies of that agreement will absolutely save you so many headaches and thousands of pounds in just this type of issue. So that's all from me. I hope you found this useful. I try and keep it as real as 100% honest with you as possible. I love property, I love rent to rent, but it's not always easy. So. If you want to do this, you need to pull up your big person pants and get ready to rock and roll because it ain't always going to be smooth. All right. Don't let them fool you. Some of these property educators and all these people out there, they'll tell you it's all good. It's all rainbows. It ain't always going to be like that. But if you're willing to put the work in and get the systems and learn and move forward, it is epic. I hope you find this useful. Subscribe, comment below, like this if you've enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video.